it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. There's a monster in the mountains of Afghanistan. You can call me Jack. What I'm about to disclose happened back in the summer of 2014. We were embedded in the northern mountains of Afghanistan. Our mission was simple. Help rebuild a village and train the locals to defend themselves against the Taliban. The smell of human feces and body odor assaulted my nostrils as the newly trained fighting men of the small Afghan village began to rise in the early morning light. We are in the country close to six months now and the locals began to slowly accept us in this village after the harsh training we put the volunteers through and the fearsome fighting against the Taliban. Our hair was long and shaggy and our beards were unkempt. It was completely out of regulations for normal forces, but for my fellow Green Berets and myself, being embedded with local nationals is more than just training and hunting down bad guys. You also have to look the part and nothing screams, hey, we're foreigners, like clean cut and shaven men. We were not the only team in the area, of course, but our team at the time was given the task to reach out and help in this particular area. Our 12-man ODA team was split into two groups, Alpha and Bravo. I was with Bravo on this particular mission. This place gives me the freaking creeps. Matt, our JTAC and communication specialist, mumbled as I walked past him towards our observation post and sniper hide. He was messing with our long-range radios in an attempt to contact one of the FOBs we were operating out of back to the south. We were all situated on a small observation post on a mountainside to the east of the village, giving us perfect visibility of the surrounding area and the main paths of travel leading in and out of the village. Lucky for us, emplacements were already set and built. Observation posts and trench lines were left over from the Soviet invasion back in the 80s, giving us a very bloody reminder of what happened to those before us. Our newly trained soldiers told ghost stories of the Afghan warriors before them, sneaking up on unsuspecting Soviet troops in the middle of the night and slitting their throats. It had us all on edge, but those were just ghost stories, after all. Ah, we're Green Berets, Matt. We embrace the suck and thrive on it, brother. And besides, after this, we're supposed to link up with the rest of the guys and we can be on our way out of this shithole. Charles, our weapons sergeant, stated as he spat a stream of tobacco juice out onto the dusty mountainside as he scanned the area with his Barrett 50 cal sniper rifle from his hide. Jack, what's the situation on our guys? Gabe, our ADC, asked me as he shifted his weight, trying to get the blood flowing in his legs again. He'd been sitting beside Charles, acting as his spotter almost all night before switching out with me in intervals before the sunrise. Oh. About to start morning prayer. You spot any movement? I blew air into my hands, trying to warm them up as I kneeled by him at the observation post. Ah, nothing but a few goats and some musk deer. He rolled his shoulders and stretched his arms out wide. We need to talk to the village elder today and find out where else these Taliban assholes are hiding. The sooner we deal with them, the faster we can get this village fixed up and be on our way. I'll make sure you all stay hydrated. We're going to need a resupply soon, running low on fluids. Chris, our combat medic, poked his head out of his sleeping bag and smiled at all of us with a toothbrush hanging out of his mouth. I have some demo and other toys if we need to blow shit up. Tanner, our engineer, came walking down the small trail to the northern side of the OP, with one of the newly trained fighters at his side. <sighs> you two already moved that far in the relationship? Chris joked before narrowly dodging an incoming rock thrown by Tanner. After the rest of the locals on our team finished with their morning prayers and got ready, we started walking down towards the village, leaving Charles and Matt along with Tanner at the OP to provide overwatch. Matt, Charles, Tanner, keep us posted. Gabe spoke into his mic piece as we descended down towards the village. The village in and of itself was small compared to some of the others we'd worked around in the past. Now, each village has its own customs and traditions, and it's usually headed by an elder. The Elder has the utmost respect in the village, and has the final say in the day-to-day -day actions and dealings. What he says goes. Gabe, along with Doc and myself, planned on speaking with the Elder to try and find out where this Taliban encampment that had been talked about by the locals for the past few months was located, so we could eliminate it, putting the bad guys out of business. 
It would be a win for both sides, and potentially create an ally in the long run. A military-aged male spotted us approaching from the east and ran back into the village to alert the others of our arrival. One of the village elders, tending to one of the poppy fields, regarded us with a hateful stare as we walked past him towards the village elder's house. We'd already recruited four of the men from the village to fight for us, and we were moving into part two of our plan, finding the bad guys. Peace be with you, Gabe spoke in Dari as he removed his helmet, clipping it to his plate carrier and let his rifle fall in its sling as we approached the house. Two military-aged males were standing outside on the flanks of the entrance. The one on the left, a tall and lengthy male, held an SKS, and the one on the right, more lean and well-built, was holding an ancient-looking Mosin bolt action rifle, low and at the ready. I looked behind us, scanned the rest of the village, as Gabe introduced us and our cigars if we could meet with the elder. To our south, I spotted a black dog running across the dirt street before ducking into a compound and nothing else in particular. Afghanistan was a quiet place, no lawnmowers or cars. It felt like another world entirely. When things got loud, you knew it was going to be bad. Inside the elder's house were blankets and pillows that lined the walls, illuminated by an oil lamp. Two figures emerged from the back room and moved into the dim light, revealing a younger-looking Afghani with a mop of black hair on his head and an elderly man with a walking cane. The ancient-looking elder had a large scar running down the right side of his face that scrawled over his right eye, leaving it cloudy. His reddish dyed beard was bushy and nearly as big as mine, leaving me with a small feeling of jealousy as he took a seat across from us at a hookah looking at each of us slowly as if sizing us up for a fight before finally speaking. You wish to kill the Taliban, yes? His voice was strong for such an old-looking man. Well, Gabe asked if we could be seated before giving an answer. The elder simply nodded in return as we took a seat across from him. Thank you for your hospitality. We're very grateful. Gabe sat down cross-legged and adjusted his gear so he could sit more comfortably. We wish to kill the Taliban, but we need help. He gestured to the dock and me before continuing. Your sons and brothers are willing to fight with us. We just need to know where the Taliban are. When they're taken care of, we can help you rebuild faster. As they talked, our radio began to come to life with all kinds of traffic. Some were from Alpha Team and some were from others I didn't recognize. Outlaw, this is Viper 2-6. We're on standby if you need us. Over. Viper was the call sign for one of the Apache helicopter gunships that were going to support us on this mission. Luckily for us, we were able to have air support on this op. Viper 26, this is Outlaw 3. We read your 5 by. We appreciate the help. We'll keep you posted. Out. Matt responded before the chatter died down. My sons and brothers will die for your cause, not our own. The elder responded stoically, making Gabe shift a little bit. The tension was like a live wire in the room as Doc looked over at me and then at the elder. It is our chorus. My men and I will do the fighting, but your sons and brothers need to learn how to fight with us. We have the help that can wipe out the enemy. Just show us where they are. Gabe produced a map from the front of his plate carrier and opened it up, pointing to our location. All you have to do is point where they are on the map, and they'll be gone. He looked the elder in the eyes and held his gaze. I could tell that the old Afghan warrior was holding back for a reason, and we were about to find out why. They are here, but be warned. It is cursed land. Don't stay there long, or you will die. The elder pointed to a valley a few clicks to the west. Gabe put his finger on the spot and circled it. I promise you, we will make them go away, he reassured the elder once more, before a young boy brought in some tea on a silver tray. The boy wore a typical Afghan dress and makeup. His eyes were deep brown and reminded me of my son back home. I quickly pushed that thought to the back of my mind and accepted the tea. Thoughts like those could get people killed out here. Then my mind turned to how this kid could grow up to fight us one day, and that made me feel sick to my stomach. Gabe talked to the elder some more, sipping on some of the tea before the tall guard from outside stepped inside, speaking quickly. I caught the words, Taliban and attack, 
before shots rang out, causing all of us to take up a defensive posture inside the clay house. Taliban are trying to show some skin in this game, Doc perked up as the gunfire increased. Gabe put his helmet back on and began speaking over the comms. Gents, watch your status. He spoke quickly as another shot rang out from the south side of the village. Striker 1, this is 3. I have PID on the combatants on the southern end of the village. Charles spoke with a calm and collected voice as the shooting became more frequent and sporadic. Are your people shooting? Gabe asked the elder before activating his PTT button. No. It is the Taliban. They are trying to run. His cryptic response made me uneasy as Gabe responded to Charles. You're cleared to engage the enemy combat in the Striker 3. A short moment later, a low bass and thunderous <laughs> boomed in the distance, and then the shooting stopped. To Iki Aie, they're at the south corner by the water well. The elder followed us to where the dead man was slain. One of them was missing his head, and the other had a hole the size of a brick in his gaping chest cavity. The one that took the round to the head had an AK and some Russian grenades strapped to his belt. The other was an older-looking fighter with graying hair and a neatly trimmed beard. Even in their mangled state, I could tell that they'd been on the run from something. Their clothing was caked in dry blood and mud, along with burns. Quickly pulling out my digital camera, I started taking photos for forensics, along with their prints. The rest of the forensic kit was backed up at the OP, so Command would have to wait for me to upload the data. I told you, they are running. Do not go there. The village elder picked up the dead man's rifles and looked at us one more time. You all will die there. He was escorted back to his house by our newly trained men and was left alone. It took us a couple of minutes to return to the OP. Gabe had to explain to our DC what exactly had happened step by step as we worked our way back up the mountain. I entered my little tent and began uploading the pictures and the copies of the prints onto our database to check if the guys we'd whacked were on our shit list, and sure enough, they were. The older one was a bomb maker from Jalalabad. The younger one was from Pakistan. It wasn't uncommon to see foreign fighters joining from the surrounding cities. As the saying goes, where there's shit, there are flies. A loud commotion outside my tent caught my attention after finishing with the upload. Wondering what the hell was going on, I peeked my head out to see all of the men we'd trained walking back to their village. God, this is great. Where the hell are they going? I asked aloud to anyone who'd answer before one of them began to argue with Gabe. The Afghani was pissed and speaking too fast for me to pick anything up while shaking a bored fist in the air. Gabe shouted something back in Dari and waved the man off before shaking his head and kicking over one of our MRE boxes. Uh, bastards are afraid to go to the encampment. That old man has been feeding them freaking ghost stories, and they're all scared they'll be cursed. He spat in the dirt and looked at all of us before letting out a sigh. Uh, uh, SR feeds from the past two days show that there were at least 20 to 30 fighters at the encampment at one point, but it looks empty now. Matt joined in. Alpha could leave the COP and assist us with the gunship, or we can try and talk those guys in the village into helping us out, but I doubt they will. I joined in next. <sighs> Pack it up, gents. We're going to get eyes on this place and wipe it out. Gabe rolled up his sleeping bag and collected the rest of his gear, and we followed suit as fast as possible. We packed up all of our gear and stowed it on our small all-terrain buggies. Just as we were about to leave the village to go recon the area, one of the men from the village came walking over to us. As he got closer, I could make out that it was the lengthy kid guarding the village elder's home. I waved at him and put on a fake smile as he looked at our buggies. All of our gear was alien to the kid. We must have looked like we were from another world. After a moment of silence, he finally spoke up. My father was not lying to you. That place is cursed, but uh, I will show you how to get there safely. He looked over at Gabe with a cautious gaze. You can't go alone. It's dangerous. Let me help you. He slung his mosin over his shoulder and waited for an answer. What do you think, Chief? I mean, 
If we take him, he turns into a liability. And on top of that, he's the village elder's son. I kicked a small pebble away from the GMV, waiting for the final answer. Gabe thought it over for a minute before scratching his beard, looking over at me with a shit-eating grin. Yeah, you can work with us. He'll fight with you. Gabe pointed at me and got in the driver's seat of his GMV. Jack, make sure nothing happens to him. The kid smiled at Tanner as he sat in the back of the GMV right next to me. You can call me Jack. I held out a fist, and the kid gave me a confused look before holding up his fist. I bumped it and gave him a quick nod before scanning my sectors. Well, the kid had some spirit. Making this trip would make him a hero back at the village. It took the better part of the day to get the GMVs halfway to the encampment. The rough terrain and the washed out roads made it hard for us to traverse through the winding countryside. Bravo, watch your status, over. Our DC asked over comms as wind whipped at my face as we sped up the mountainside. We found the enemy encampment and we're conducting a quick reconnaissance mission, over. Gabe's staticky voice crackled in my headset before going quiet. Roger that, Bravo. Keep me posted. Out. It seemed like hours before Tanner slowed down the GMV. He killed the engine and put it in park next to a steep cliff face off to our right as the sun was beginning to fall beneath the mountain ridgeline, casting a dark shadow on us. We'll move on foot from here. It's not too far away now. Malim spoke up as we got out and stretched our legs. Matt... Get an eye in the sky and make sure there's no one around to surprise us. Matt shook his head and tapped away on a tablet in his hands. Cloud coverage is fucking with the thermal imaging. Don't see anything close. We should be clear for a while. He walked over to Gabe and showed him the tablet before putting it back into his bag. Gabe stood quiet for a moment before rallying everyone up. All right, gents. Change my mind on the recon up. Let's get eyes on and call in the gunship to clear this fucking place. We were ready for a fight, and we were going to get one. Tanner rigged motion detectors to the GMVs and pulled an old-school M79 grenade launcher from one of the compartments in our vehicle. Uh, just in case we need to really put something down. He winked at me as he joined the rest of the group up towards the mountain path. Charles replaced his 50 cal for a smaller caliber MK-14 EBR, it was still a hard-hitting rifle, but it lacked the range and firepower compared to the larger caliber one. The rest of us had modified M4s outfitted with suppressors and other equipment to give us an edge on our enemies. We also grabbed our NODs in case we were out longer than expected. Viper 2-1, this is Outlaw. You available for tasking? Over. Matt whispered as we continued up the path. The sun had gone down and the stars were beginning to fill the sky and soon it would be completely dark. Outlaw, this is Viper 2-1. We're on standby. Give us your grid and target. Over. He wasted no time giving them our position and the position of the enemy encampment as we walked up the mountain. It should be right over this, Malim whispered back to me, pointing at a cluster of bushes off to our left as we scoured the side of a steep cliff face. We'd been walking for almost an hour. I put a finger up to my mouth and signaled him to be quiet. With an ODs mounted to our helmets and rifles slung against our chests, we pushed on for another hour. Malim slowly maneuvered up and over a large boulder and then stopped, quickly making himself as small as possible as something flew over our heads. I felt the wind get pushed hard down the neck of my uniform and helmet as the unseen thing flew outwards. Looking up towards the sky, I saw a large winged figure jet towards the adjacent mountaintop before disappearing into the mountainside. What the fuck was that? Tanner mouthed to me as Malim got back up and continued forward towards the encampment, without speaking aloud, but I could see that his lip was trembling as he muttered something under his breath. The burnt-out fire pit glowed brightly in our night vision as we stalked along the outer perimeter of the encampment. Mutilated bodies and weapons, along with multiple spent shell casings, were scattered all over the place as we approached, with weapons raised. Our IR lasers bounced over the dead bodies and scanned for any targets. 
A large cave entrance was visible to the left side of the camp. Barrels and sandbags were set up at the sides, as well as the Dushka machine gun that had been toppled over. Matt, Tanner and Charles took the right flank as Gabe, Malim and myself took the left. As I cleared my sector, one of the fighters lying on the ground near me let out a long, ragged and wet breath, causing me to snap my rifle in his direction. We have a live one over here, I whispered into my mic as I closed in on the dying fighter. The fighter had a very deep gash along his chest and was missing his right arm below the elbow. I kneeled on his left arm and put my hand over his mouth. Quiet. Quiet, I whispered. Tears filled the man's eyes as he looked up at me. I could feel his mouth moving under my glove as Doc came over through the brush. Ah, he's a goner. So are the rest of these guys. I counted at least ten dead fighters. Something's not right here. I looked around the torn-up encampment, then over to Tanner and the others on the right side of the camp, signalling them to look around for potential threats, before Matt began to speak over comms. The gunship has visual on something right here. His voice was cut off by a guttural screech from a few feet in front of us. What the fuck was that? Doc looked over to me as something came tearing through the clusters of bushes and trees. I stood up and started backpedaling away from the now dead fighter at my feet as a thing crashing through the brush emerged by one of the dead fighters by the cave entrance. What I can only describe as a bat-like creature, with the upper half of a torso hung from its mouth, looked at us with beady black eyes. It crawled on all fours as it eyed us. It had pointed ears and long, jagged claws at the tips of its wings. Without saying a word, I fired three rounds, causing it to drop the body from its mouth and let out a deafening screech, making me clamp my eyes closed and cover my ears. My heart kicked against my chest and my adrenaline began to burn like fire through my veins. What the fuck was that thing? Matt whispered harshly. It looked like a freaking bat, Charles joined in. All right, lock it up. I'm going to contact Alpha and see what we're doing here. Gabe finally spoke up before another loud screech came from the cave. I did a quick head count and realized we were missing one person. Malim. My heart sunk as I counted again. This time I noticed his rifle near the cave entrance. It was broken against the cave wall and a blood trail led inside. Oh, it took the kid. Without thinking I started moving into the cave. Where the fuck are you going? Gabe growled, but I ignored him and pushed on. The rest of the guys caught up with me a few seconds later as I stepped over some blood-soaked mattresses without saying a word. We were going to get the kid back or die trying. As we pushed further into the cave, more signs of fighting became evident. Spent brass and bodies started lining the walls as a chirping sound began to reverberate off them. The cave split off into two different pathways, leaving us dead in our tracks. Fuck. All right, I'll take the left with Matt and Charles. I looked back at my teammates and waited for a response. Gabe just shook his head and pointed down the right pathway. We'll take the right. Keep your fucking eyes peeled and get that kid out of here. Without saying another word, we pushed down the left pathway quickly in hopes of finding Malim. I hoped that he was still alive, not just for his sake, but for ours. If he died, the last six months of our training and relationship building went down the drain. Jack, yeah, it's Gabe. We reached a dead end over here. Looks like an ammo dump. I'll have Tanner rig it for dead. How's it looking on your end? Before I was able to respond, the quiet sound of sobbing from somewhere in front of us got my attention. The glowing eyes of something pierced out through the dark cave a few feet in front of me. As we moved closer, the sobbing got louder. Malim, Malim, we're here, I whispered before a dark, shadowy figure came flying towards me, slamming into my chest and dragging me back across the ground. I screamed out of pure terror as I felt something sharp pierce into my shoulders as I got dragged along the rocky cave floor. Oh, fuck, oh, fuck. I craned my neck upwards to see the creature scuttling along the walls. 
Raising my rifle at an awkward position, I began to pump rounds into its ass and stomach in hopes it would release me, and sure enough, it did with another deafening screech. The wind was knocked out of my lungs as it released me from its grip, causing me to slam into the floor. I heard suppressed rifles barking in the distance as rounds impacted around me. The guys must have thought I was dead. Hey, stop fucking shooting at me. I screamed over comms as the faint outlines of three figures made their way towards me. Charles, Matt, and a wounded Malim were at my feet in a matter of seconds helping me stand. Can you walk? Charles checked me over quickly before Gabe's voice finally spoke in my headset. You guys need to get the fuck out of that cave. His always calm and collected voice was now strained and panic-filled. We're working on it. Jack got hit. Charles strained to say as he helped me walk towards the exit. As we walked, more high-pitched chirping noises began to drown out our voices as he got closer to us with each step. Ah, oh, fuck that. Matt reached onto his vest and produced a fragmentation grenade. He pulled off the electrical tape around the pin and prepped it. Fuck you. He threw the grenade towards the sounds like a baseball pitcher before running to catch up with us. A moment later, a deafening <clears throat> erupted from where the frag had landed, causing dust and debris to rain all around us. Dust now filled our vision, limiting us to only a few meters as rocks pelted my helmet. Dust filled my lungs and mouth, making it hard to breathe. We'd been walking for what seemed like hours before the ambient moonlight shone through a thin layer of dust in front of us. As we exited, Tanner waved us over to the right of the entrance furiously. Fire in the hole! Fire in the hole! He squeezed on something in his hand three times, and a moment later we felt the ground trembling beneath our feet as a fireball erupted from the entrance. I have some more demo. I want to seal off this fucking cave. He wiped the sweat from his face and reached into his bag before another loud screech came from the cave. Fuck that! Let the gunship do it! Matt yelled as he moved away from the entrance and back towards the path we'd taken. Viper 2-1, this is Outlaw. Target's been lassoed with the IR laser. Over. Matt circled his rifle on the cave entrance as the Apache gunship opened up with its 30mm cannons and Hellfire rockets. It was quite the spectacle as we watched the rounds and rockets impact under the clear sky. Our IR beacons attached to our helmets flashed brightly, making us look like lightning bugs from the air. Outlaw, this is Viper 2-1. We are Winchester. Over. Good luck, boys. And with that, the gunship flared off and headed south, leaving us alone. The cool Afghan air rushed through my hair as we travelled back to the village. I was banged up, but still alive. Malim had suffered some deep lacerations, but was able to be patched up by Doc. His father, the elder, was pissed, but everyone had mad respect for the kid after that incident. We fixed up the village and trained the others in basic fighting and combat medicine the following week, before leaving that area for good. Now I've seen my fair share of crazy shit, but one thing's certain. There is a monster in the mountains of Afghanistan. So there you go, a pretty cool um, Afghan war story for your Sunday evening's entertainment. Just a half hour one tonight. They don't all have to be too long, do they? Come on, sometimes I can do a shorter one like this. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> well, okay, um, got over my uh, COVID shot and uh, feeling a lot better. I was out of it for about a day or so, but uh, feeling a lot better now, and um, I highly recommend it, of course. <laughs> okay, well, that's enough for, for one day. Um, I've got a huge backlog of enormous stories, two hours, three hour ones, and I just need to find time to do them all. Um, some really, really great stuff lined up in the coming weeks and months, and I hope you're going to stick around and join me for all of those. But that is definitely enough for Sunday. Go on, go off and have fun. Enjoy yourself. Till the next time, very, very sweet dreams, and bye-bye.